Our scripture reading today is from the book of Luke, chapter 14, verses 16 through 24. Jesus replied, A certain man hosted a large dinner and invited many people. When it was time for the dinner to begin, he sent his servant to tell the invited guests, Come, the dinner is now ready. One by one, they all began to make excuses. The first one told him, I bought a farm and must go see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I bought five teams of oxen and I'm going to check on them. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married so I can't come. When he returned, the servant reported these excuses to his master. The master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go quickly to the city streets, the busy ones and the side streets, and bring the poor, crippled, blind, and lame. The servant said, Master, your instructions have been followed and there is still room. The master said to the servant, Go to the highways and the back alleys and urge people to come in so that my house will be filled. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will taste my dinner. As I was thinking this morning um, about this morning, it occurred to me that I think this is the fourth or fifth time that I've had the great honor of being asked to speak with you all. And every time our pastor asks me to preach, the biblical text has to do with food. Uh, <laughs> I'm afraid this means that our pastor knows my priorities in life uh, all too well. But it also means that the Bible has a huge number of significant passages about food and especially about meals. From Genesis and the food provided in the Garden of Eden, uh, to the book of Revelation and the great wedding feast in chapter 19. The Bible is all about the gift of God that is food. And not just food, but especially the sharing of food. All the Gospels tell us that Jesus was always getting into trouble for eating with the wrong people, people who were viewed as unclean. Uh, somehow they were the wrong crowd or for feeding people in unexpected settings, or even for letting his disciples pick up food to eat on the Sabbath. So in his life and, and in the parables that he told, including today's parable, Jesus is often made real to us in uh, what he came for, who he is, through how he ate meals or how he talked about meals. Today's parable, and thank you, Anthony, for the lovely reading. Today's parable is known as the story of the great banquet. And like so many of the stories in the Gospel of Luke, it is the story of a great reversal. The first reversal has to do with the very nature of a banquet. Now, let me ask, have you all ever been to a banquet? You can tell I've been a teacher, so I always ask people to raise their hands. I, I have to admit, I've been to an awful lot of banquets, and I pretty much never like them. <laughs> Several reasons. First of all, you have to dress up. And those of you who know me well know I hate dressing up. Second, it's formal and big. And then you can't sit wherever you want. You have to sit where there's that little fancy card with your name on it. And I like that. Um, and then there's a head table, which is very formal, and that's where the important people sit, including the speakers. Yes, speakers. There's always more than one. <laughs> and even the people who introduce the speakers are long-winded. So it's worse than a sermon. <laughs> but... But the worst thing about a banquet to me is the food is rarely any good. And they're trying to bring out all the soup at the same time and the gets cold, just not good. 
But as I prepared for today and I thought about banquets, I remembered one banquet that I really did enjoy. This has been many years ago. It was a professional banquet and it had all the negative traits that I just listed and I was sitting at a table with strangers. But something funny happened. The entrees arrived at the table. It was either beef or shrimp and we had to order them in advance. But after we were served, one woman at the table said, I'm allergic to shrimp and I ordered the beef, but I just remembered today is a Friday of Lent and I'm Catholic, so I can't eat the beef. Would any of you like to have it? So she passed her, way, her plate around and people divvied up her roast beef. And then someone said, well, if you're not eating your beef, then you should take some of my rice. And someone else said, there's too much salad for me. Would someone like to share some of my salad? And pretty soon, all the plates were zipping around the table. Everyone had plenty to eat of what they wanted. And as those plates zipped around the table, the conversation started to zip around too. And what began as a very stodgy, traditional, professional affair ended with real sharing and real communing. That was one kind of banquet, and that was what I would call a banquet that became a feast. In today's parable, we hear of another banquet that becomes transformed. It's no wonder that the first invitees to this banquet decided not to go. They were rich people, and they didn't need a mediocre meal. But as I read and reread this parable, it occurred to me to think more of this story in its context of Jesus and his audience. And it occurred to me that possibly his listeners heard at least part of this story as a joke. Jesus and his audience were, after all, not quite in the banqueting economic arena. So it occurs to me to think of this story as sort of a joke and sort of a folk tale. Here's the joke part. Jokes always have three people, right? Three guys walk into a bar. <laughs> so we have three people in this banquet story, and they stand in for all those who refuse to show up at the banquet. First of all, these people have rich people problems. The first guy sends his excuse, and he says he's bought land, and now he has to inspect it. Well, the audience of Jesus, these people probably didn't own any land, but they weren't stupid and they knew that you inspect land and then buy it, not the other way around. So they probably would have laughed at that excuse. And then the second person says he's bought five yokes of oxen. Now that would be a massive expenditure. And only now is he going to try them out. Again, something anyone with a brain would have done before buying the oxy, oxen. So for the third guy, well, he's just gotten married, so uh, maybe he has a good excuse, but one that the audience might very well have chuckled at hearing. <laughs> so the beginning of this parable, I think, sets up rich people uh, as rude, but also as objects of fun. And this is often the way things go in fairy tales or folk tales too, where everything gets reversed. One that we all know is Cinderella. Cinderella who starts off in the very lowest tier of society, but ends up getting married to the prince. But the story doesn't end there. It doesn't end with the master giving up or condemning his guests. The dinner that he's prepared doesn't just go into the garbage can. After hearing of the refusals, the master calls to his servant and he tells him to bring in a different set of guests. The poor, the injured, the blind, the lame. Those who live in the streets because they have no home. And then the banquet becomes something else. It becomes a feast. I want my house to be filled the master says. I once attended a retreat where we were invited to hear a biblical passage and then to think, who am I in this story? That's a really good exercise. 
So as we hear this parable of the great banquet, we might ask ourselves, who am I in this story? Who am I and who am I being called to be in this story? Am I the invitee who has something better to do? Am I the servant? Am I the master giving the party? Or am I one of the guests being invited at the very last minute? Some of us have felt like that one invited at the last minute to fill up the table. But we are the ones who get to dine with the master. Myself, when I think of this parable, I know who I would like to be. I would like to be the servant who gets to give the good news to all these people whose noses have been pushed up against the windows to give them the good news that they are invited to the party. They are no longer rejected, no longer strangers, no longer on the outside looking in because our God, our master is too big for that. So who might be at this table? Recently, I had the wonderful opportunity to attend a workshop at Duke Divinity School. The workshop uh, was called Reconciling Church. It was a week long and I had a chance to get to know a lot of remarkable people. The idea of this workshop is to build up churches that are reconciling in all the areas where we tend to differ the places where churches should and could and must do more to bring about the kingdom or the kingdom of God. I met some truly remarkable women and men that week, people from all over the world who are doing incredible things with their lives through their faith. I met a man named Richard. 20 years ago, he was addicted to drugs and programs had failed him. In absolute desperation, he entered a faith-based treatment facility. 20 years later, he's still there, now as its executive director. I saw Richard cry when he talked about people who left that program before they were ready to, and I knew how deeply that touched his heart. I would like to be the servant who could go out and say to Richard, you come to this banquet and be comforted. I met a woman from Indonesia named Susie, who as a young girl was sold into slavery. That still happens in many parts of this world. It's a stain upon this world. After many years, Susie managed to escape from slavery. And now she counsels and finds jobs for other women who have been in her situation and who are coming out of that unthinkable life. She does this even though working with them makes her remember every day the horrors that she herself suffered. She wears a rubber band on her wrist. When she has a flashback, she stings herself with the rubber band to bring her back to the present. To Susie, I would want to say, come to our banquet table. You will always be safe here. I met a man named Reverend William Barber, who was the head of the NAACP in North Carolina. And he called upon us to recognize and combat the ongoing sin of racism in America. Reverend Barber says, when people say, well, Work in justice, you know, that's, that's, that's just not my anointing. He says to them, you better go back because you didn't get all your anointing. Reverend Barber has difficulty walking. He manages with a pair of canes. But he marches in North Carolina against voter suppression and police violence and all the things that, that are going on there and elsewhere. I would want to say to Reverend Barber, you come to the table and put down your canes and rest. I met a remarkable woman from Morocco. Her name was Yamina Mermer. Yamina is a Muslim woman who works in interface peacemaking and understanding. Over lunch one day, I asked her how her work was going. 
She was quiet for a minute. And then she smiled and said, it is a long journey. To her, I would like to be the servant who says, you come to our table and rest from this long journey. I met a woman named Alice who felt a call to ministry and followed it. Even though she's older and has many pressing issues with family and health and finances, she graduated from Duke and she was ordained this spring and just a few weeks ago began her first job as a pastor in a new church in an underserved community. To Alice, I would love to say, you've been feeding other people all your life. You come to this table and rest and be fed. I met a pastor and also a Divinity School faculty member, Edgardo Colon. He works with immigrants and he said this, God's creation has no border. Borders are scars on the body of God. Edgardo works very hard to bring simple dignity to people who are stigmatized with the label undocumented. To Edgardo, I would like to say, you come and share at this table, this fiesta. But remember, the master says, I want my table full. So I would ask Edgardo to bring those people made in God's image who are trying to earn a bare living and save their families from starvation. I would want to be the servant who would ask Susie to come and bring the women that she works with and Richard to come and bring the addicted people he works with because the master wants our table to be full. I think the master wants us to kick off our shoes loosen our belts, and talk to our neighbors. This is how we move toward being a reconciling community. I would want to be the servant who gets to call all of God's people into community, who says you and you and you and you and you, and never ever you, but not you. This, I think, is the steady call every day of the Jesus that we try to follow. Jesus comes to us and calls us to be his servants in this world and to do what he did, to heal, to nurture, to give hope, and to feed the hungry. Another one of Luke's wonderful stories and accounts that we hear solely in the Gospel of Luke is the story of the walk to Emmaus. You all know that story, I imagine. Some of Jesus' followers are journeying to Emmaus after his crucifixion. The resurrected Jesus joins them on the road, but they don't know him. Even when he teaches them and speaks to them, they don't know him. Finally, they reach their destination. They ask him to join them. They still don't know him. But they sit down to dinner, and then they know him in the breaking of the bread. Whether we are banqueting or feasting or sharing the simplest meal, may we all continue to know and to share the inviting love of a God who is bigger than our divisions, bigger than our imaginations, bigger than our hungers. And may we always invite as we have been invited to the great table. Amen. Amen.